All right, so today's today's lecture, just kind of learn learn what the heck this class is all about. Uh, but first, real quick, just wanted to talk about my my career path, how I got to where I'm at. So that's that's me. I'm Derek Larson, Gonzaga grad in 2008, bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Right after graduating, got hired on as an HVAC design engineer heating, ventilation, air conditioning at a, a small company in the Spokane Valley called Northwest Engineering. So worked there for about two years, two and a half years. And uh, most of you, you were probably pretty young when this happened, but that was the uh, the last time we had a major recession. And um, unfortunately I was let go in 2010, but luckily I got picked up as an energy engineer with McKinstry, uh, which our building is right across the street from the Gonzaga baseball field. So if you haven't noticed it, I'm sure you've driven by that building many times. Um, right now, our parking lot is an absolute disaster because we're building a new um, a new med building for UW and Gonzaga. Uh, but my role there was performing energy audits, energy savings calculations, and to develop energy projects, which that's really what this class is about, as, as I'll go into more today. In 2015, took a little detour because I, uh, I needed a master's degree to teach a course here. Uh, so that was a requirement the school had. So I went and got my master's degree in energy engineering at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. I'm still at McKinstry. Uh, but now, since 2018, I am no longer an energy engineer, uh, but I now I'm back to doing HVAC design as a, uh, a lead design engineer, still with McKinstry. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the HVAC design and energy engineering skill sets are very complementary, so it, it was pretty easy to kind of go back and forth between these roles. And I'm also here. Uh, so this is my fourth time, I would think teaching this class. So hopefully I got it down pretty well. So real quick, uh, up on Blackboard, the syllabus is on there. Take a look. I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, I mean, part of it is just talking about what you're expected to learn in this class, which we kind of talk about today. There are some notes about grading and stuff and, and tests, but we'll talk more about tests when we get uh, closer to a midterm. Uh, and then and then the final exam as well. All the material I'm covering in this course, it, it is pretty broad stroke and kind of simplified to a degree. I mean, coming in, not knowing anything about HVAC, or, or maybe some of you do, but I, I have to presume you're starting from ground level. So there, there's a lot to, to learn and uh, a lot to cover. And so I don't get into the nitty gritty too much, but um, yeah, one, one semester is not a lot of time to cover a bunch of this stuff. Office hours. So I have blocked out Tuesdays and Fridays, 12 to 1 p.m., uh, but I'm only going to do it by appointment only. The reason being, the three years I've taught this course, I've had exactly zero students ask for me during office hours. So I make myself available, but um, I'm not going to show up unless one of you specifically requests that I be there. And, and it'll be all over Zoom. My emails, larsond at gonzaga.edu. So you can use that for anything class related. And then my, uh, my work email, derekl at mckinstry.com. If there's anything else, um, you know, say professionally or whatever you want to talk about, Let's uh, let's use that email. All right, so let's get into it. What is energy auditing uh, slash energy engineering? Basis of an energy audit is you're going to look at building systems, identify and ultimately quantify that waste because wasted energy equals wasted money. And at the end of the day, that's that's what a lot of our clients really care about. 
I mean, energy, saving energy is great. More and more companies are wanting to be green and do green initiatives and energy projects. But at the end of the day, it comes down to money a lot of times. So if you save energy, you're going to save money. And uh, for these audits, the idea is we want to propose solutions. So as an energy auditor or an energy engineer, you are an expert on building systems. So how do systems use energy? How do they waste it? How do we fix that? And a big caveat here is how do we fix that without compromising something else? And I'll have an example further on today where I mentioned a way we can save energy, but it causes a problem elsewhere. The reason this is important is about 50% of all energy is wasted, or at least that's what the estimates say. So instead of constructing new buildings, let's optimize the ones we have. I mean, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of buildings out there that can optimize their energy use. So the goals, hey, let's reduce energy use, reduce emissions, build a more sustainable future. And so here's kind of a sample HVAC system. Now you're not going to know what all these components are, but all of these components are, are fairly typical in a commercial building. So, I mean, there's multiple components here. Up on the roof, you have a cooling tower. You have a system of ductwork running through out your, your building. Um, you have your air handler, which is going to have a fan that's going to move air, either hot air or cold air, depending on the season. Down in the basement, they're showing a boiler and a chiller and an energy management system to control all of this stuff. So as an energy engineer, you need to look at all of these components and figure out, well, how, how is all this stuff working together and what's the most optimum way to run this equipment? Some related roles that are kind of uh, adjacent to this, this energy auditing idea. You could go work for an energy services company, also called an ESCO. So McKinstry is an ESCO. So they do audits and energy savings calculations. So if you tell a customer, you should do this project to save energy, they're going to want to know how much energy or is that going to save. So you have to be able to quantify that using a, an energy savings calculation. And really you're gonna act as a consultant to ultimately reduce their energy bill. Another form of this is called performance contracting. And this is what McKinstry gets into where when we tell a, <clears throat> when we tell a customer, you should do this project, we give a guarantee. We guarantee you're going to save X amount of energy if you do this project. And if you don't save those, uh, save that amount of energy, we will write you a check for whatever the Delta is. So that's kind of used as a, a carrot to incentivize people to do these energy projects. You could go into, uh, you could become an energy manager, meaning you get hired by a company to manage and optimize that company's energy use. So I, I say it's kind of like an energy accountant. You know, in, in the month of January, how much gas did you use in your building? Well, what did you use the previous January? Uh, so you have to track that stuff and also help your company pursue those energy savings projects. And this isn't uncommon for large companies, especially in manufacturing. So in any manufacturing facility, those buildings use a ton of energy to make whatever, whatever thing that they make. And there may be ways to optimize that process and save energy. You could also go the route that I'm in right now and become a design engineer, also known as an engineering consultant. And I, yeah, I say design engineering kind of generically, but really HVAC design, that's the bread and butter here. The, the HVAC systems in a building, they are linked to energy. That, um, they're, they're intrinsically linked. Uh, a large chunk of the energy use in any commercial building is going to be 
correlated to the HVAC systems. And so as a design engineer, you're going to optimize that design and operation of all those systems. Or you could go work for an automatic building controls company. So I mentioned when we were looking at that diagram uh, of an HVAC system, they had a energy management system. So that's basically this big controller that tells all of the pieces of equipment what to do. And so if you're gonna work for that company, you're gonna optimize that automated control system. So you're going to be writing the programming of that equipment. If this thing is true, the unit should do this. And if this other thing is true, it should do this other thing. Or you could go work for a utility company, which again, uh, similar to UNESCO, you will probably perform energy audits and do those energy savings calculations, often for utility incentive programs. Uh, Avista, who's our big utility company here, they pay out lots of dollars uh, as incentives for customers to save energy. And uh, for them to pay out those dollars, they'll usually do their own audits and energy savings calculations. Um, you know, they, they have their own in-house energy engineers to do that. So talking about energy generation versus the energy end use. So when people think of energy, and energy use, a lot of times people jump to renewable sources. Um, but there's an important distinction here between generation and the end use, meaning where is the energy created versus where is it actually used? And this course is all about the end use. So as a quick comparison, I mean, there, there's several different ways you can generate energy, PV solar panels, wind, uh, gas-fired, power plants, I mean, those are all ways to generate electricity. But really what we care about is where that energy is used inside the building. So they call that the end use. So the generation, yeah, I think I just stated this, um, focuses on renewables, other technologies. And a lot of times energy use is often seen as a fixed constant. So we just, we just need to find better ways to produce that energy. You know, there's, there's a lot of push right now toward getting off of fossil fuels, getting more into wind, um, PV, solar panels. And that's, that's definitely good, but that's not the only thing we need to worry about. So it's, it's not really a fixed constant. I mean, a lot of companies, they just think, they just pay their bill every month. You know, pay their electric bill, pay their gas bill, and well, that's just the cost of doing business. But um, it's it's really not a fixed constant, and a lot of our clients don't really understand that. Um, and so, thinking back to generation versus end use, is it better to generate a BTU of energy from a renewable source, or just avoid using that BTU entirely? And the important distinction here is renewable sources are not free. They're often thought of as free. And once they are installed and operating, they have a, a pretty good return on investment. But to build PV solar panels, to build wind turbines, I mean, that costs money, not just to build it, but to maintain that equipment. So renewable sources are very good, but it's not free energy as they're often thought. So if we have this opportunity to focus on the end use and just not use that BTU of energy to start with, to me, that's, that's a better way to attack this energy problem. But ultimately both the generation side and the use reduction side, we gotta attack it from both sides. I mean, they're both going to the same goal, which is uh, to reduce emissions and to provide that sustainable future. But ultimately, this course is, n we, we don't talk about the generation side. This is all about reducing the end use within the buildings. Some business sectors. So commercial buildings. This is the focus of this course. So 
commercial buildings is, I mean, it's really any office building, um, school, retail facility. That's what most of the buildings are out there in the world. And that when it comes to looking at the energy use of those buildings, HVAC, that's the big one. Which again, this is why HVAC design is so intrinsically linked with energy use of commercial buildings. So that's going to include all the fans and pumps, heating systems, cooling systems, also known as air conditioning. We need to bring in ventilation or fresh air into any commercial building, which is a little different from a house where typically houses don't bring in fresh air directly through the HVAC system, but we do in commercial buildings. Automatic controls, which I, I talked about already a little bit. And the important thing about controls is that an efficient system, in quotes there, can be controlled inefficiently, which can be a huge energy driver. And I, I have an example coming up here. And ultimately, HVAC has a big effect on occupant comfort. So how comfortable are people in those buildings? So that typically means HVAC gets a little more priority than the other energy using systems in a building. Next up on the commercial is lighting. I mean, that's the other main end use. I mean, all those lights in a building, if you think of a retail facility and how bright it is in there, I mean, that's all using energy. And then you have domestic hot water, which would be all the hot water at your sinks and showers. I mean, your house or apartment has a domestic hot water heater somewhere. And then you'll just have other miscellaneous loads, computers, TVs, etc. But it's a little harder to do stuff about computers and TVs on the energy side. So this pie chart, this is taken from the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey, which I realize is a mouthful. Uh, that's why they abbreviated it as CBEX. So in 2012, they did this monster study. Uh, and actually, they did it uh, um, before that, I think in 2003. So they update it periodically, where they do this massive survey of all kinds of buildings across the United States. And they release this, this huge data dump that shows where energy is being used in the United States. So this pie chart we're looking at here is for an office type facility. And this gives you an idea of where energy is being used in that type of building. And this is specific to offices, but you can generate similar charts from or for uh, other types of buildings like, um, like say schools. That'd be another very common one. But you can see on this chart, the HVAC items here, heating, cooling, and ventilation fans, that's 53% of the total energy use of office buildings. So that shows you where the biggest opportunity is and why HVAC is such a big part of energy auditing. And from then on out, I mean, you have domestic hot water at 3%. Not a lot of people are going to get very excited about that. Lighting at 12%. That's a decent chunk there. You could find some opportunity to save energy in this, this area. Um, refrigeration and office equipment, pretty small. And uh, computing another, I mean, that makes up a, a pretty big chunk, a little more than a quarter, but that type of equipment's a little harder to do anything about. I don't think you're going to go around and replace everybody's computers you know, with more efficient computers. Um, conceivably, you could maybe install something that will shut off the computers at night. We see that a lot in schools, but generally in an office, it's just not something we see. So in terms of the things we can do substantial projects on, HVAC and lighting, that makes up the, the big chunk of this pie. Another business sector would be residential. And in residential applications, you really have the same types of uses. So you still have HVAC, domestic hot water, lighting, um, computers, TVs, same type of stuff. 
you would see in a commercial building, but there's just not as much opportunity there. The reason being the magnitude of that energy use is so much less. I mean, uh, assuming a same size building between a commercial building and a residential building, same square footage, the magnitude of energy use in the residential application is going to be way lower, which means there's not as much opportunity there to save energy. Additionally, you really don't need an engineer to change light bulbs, change a thermostat, or blow in some roof insulation. In uh, residential HVAC specifically, the controls are fairly simple, straightforward. They're, they're kind of hard to screw up uh, in terms of how you operate them. Commercial HVAC systems are much more complicated in comparison. And the last building sector would be industrial building systems, which again, have the same categories of end uses as commercial buildings, but there are some additional ones that you have to keep in mind. The big one is process equipment, which is going to be the main end use in any industrial facility. And so this process equipment, that's the equipment that makes whatever, whatever thing that that plant makes, I mean, that, that needs some machinery to go through that process and that uses energy. And so that's where the bulk of the energy use is going to go. Now, where that gets tricky from an energy auditing perspective is every industrial building is going to be fairly unique to whatever they produce. And so it's really hard to look at their systems and to find these energy savings opportunities when they have these highly specialized processes. But compressed air, this is another uh, big energy user in an industrial building. They often have a compressed air system that serves a bunch of pneumatic tools maybe, or, or even some of the process equipment might require this, uh, this compressed air. And air compressors are, are really inefficient devices. I mean, about 80% of that energy just goes straight to waste. So ultimately, in industrial buildings, there's less of a focus on HVAC because it's a much smaller piece of that energy pie, if you think in terms of a pie chart. You can still look at it, but there's not going to be as much opportunity there relative to these other systems. I mentioned the importance of controls and that a inefficient system, or excuse me, an efficient system could be operated very inefficiently. So let's say we have two identical office buildings. They're each occupied nine hours a day, five days a week, basic, you know, Monday through Friday kind of office schedule. And let's say in building A, you got these state-of-the-art, super efficient air conditioning and heating systems Everything's brand spanking new, and on average, all of those systems draw about 100 kilowatts of operating power on average when all those systems are on. But what if all those systems are being operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even though the building is only occupied nine hours a day, five days a week? The second building, building B, well, let's say they have very inefficient air conditioning and heating systems. Everything's at least 20 years old. And on average, when everything's running in that building, it's using 200 kW of operating power when all those systems are on. But let's say that building is scheduled to operate on a tight schedule from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, uh, which is about 2,300 operating hours per year. So in this simple example, which system uses more power? Well, the new building obviously is going to use uh, a lot less power and the old system is going to use a lot more power. So at any given moment, the instantaneous power draw is going to be much more at the old building. But which system uses more energy? And so if you do the math, to arrive at what's called kilowatt hours, KWH, you take your power, K 
kW and you multiply by your operating hours per year. So 100 kW times 8760 hours per year, we arrive at 876,000 kilowatt hours per year. So that's how much en energy that building is going to use. The old building uses a lot more power, but a lot less operating hours. The total energy there is about 468,000 kilowatt hours per year. So even though that first building, much more, I'm using air quotes, efficient systems, is being operated in an inefficient way and is using substantially more energy. And if we were to assume about eight cents per kilowatt hour, which is um, about where we're at here in Spokane, building A, that new building is spending about $32,000 more in energy costs. And so it's very possible to take this very efficient system, at least on paper, hey, everything's brand new, state of the art, but they, if they operate it in a bad way using poor application of controls, in this case, they're not scheduling the equipment properly. Well, now this new building is this giant energy hog. So interactive effects and the first law of thermodynamics. So this is a key concept in energy engineering, uh, this, this idea of interactive effects. And throughout this course, this is going to come up time and again with various examples. But fundamentally, if we change one thing, what else is impacted? So as a lighting upgrade example, light fixtures produce light. And this ener energy eventually turns into heat within the room. So if you have a light bulb in your room, you're going to provide some electrical power to that light bulb. It's going to output some light to the room and some heat to the room. Now, ultimately, the light to the room will also turn into heat. As those photons hit whatever is in that room, the, the chair, the desk, the walls, uh, eventually that all turns into heat. So if we're putting in 60 watts of electrical power, ultimately we end up with 60 watts of heat power. A um, little odd phrasing, heat power, but the idea is it's watts, which is instantaneous. You put in 60 watts, you get 60 watts of heat. And if we replace those light fixtures with more efficient lighting, say we replace all these bulbs with new LED bulbs that only draw 10 watts of power, that means there's less electrical input, which is good because we're trying to save energy. But this also means there's less internal heat gain to the room. So this, this might seem weird to think about, but every light that's in uh, you know the, the room you're sitting in right now, the light above your head or the light on your desk, that is essentially an electric heater. But it's, it's an electric heater that also produces light. And really that's the purpose of it is to produce light, but it also produces heat. So what this means is if we put in more efficient lighting and we reduce the heat off of those light fixtures, this is a good thing for our cooling systems. So in the summer months, now our air conditioner doesn't have to work as hard because these lights are not putting out as much heat as they used to. But it's bad for our heating systems. So now whatever heating you have, again, in the room you are sitting in right now, you know, you probably have some electric baseboard heat or maybe a gas furnace somewhere. If the light is producing less heat, now your heating system has to produce more heat to make up the difference. So if we're gonna save power on the lighting system, we are also impacting the HVAC energy. And what if we did a significant lighting upgrade where we have a drastic reduction in that lighting power and lighting energy? Well, what if the HVAC 
heating system is not sized to handle uh, what we call the space heating load with reduced lighting energy. And those lights that were in the room, they were helping to keep the building warm. And now, because you've replaced them all, now they're less effective at keeping the space warm and your heating system has to make up the difference. And what if that difference is so great that the heating system cannot keep up now that you've upgraded these lights? Second example, let's say uh, we have a fan or a pump. It, this, this picture here is illustrating a pump example where we are going to upgrade the motor that's driving that pump. So you can see on this pump, there's a motor sitting with its, uh, the motor shaft is going inside the pump body right here and, and spinning an impeller to make water move across it. And so we're gonna replace that, that motor. Well, that electrical motor input on the pump adds heat to whatever fluid it's conveying through that pipe. So we're gonna put in some electrical energy to that pump motor. You're going to get some heat off of that thing just from the inefficiency of the motor. And that's just going to go into whatever room this pump is physically sitting in. And then the rest of it is going to be transmitted into the water itself as uh, power and eventually heat. Eventually that power will become heat. So if we're gonna run this motor with a thousand watts of power, let's say about 900 watts of that is conveyed into the fluid and you're going to have about 100 watts come off as heat just from the inefficiency of the motor. And so this is assuming about a 90% efficient motor. But what this does is this 900 watts that we have just transmitted into the fluid will now heat up the water a bit. So if that water is coming in at 160 degrees, it's going to leave a little bit warmer you know, in this case, two degrees. And maybe that's significant, maybe it's not. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? And it really depends on what the system's trying to do with the water. If the system you're looking at is trying to keep the water cold because you need some chilled water and some process in your building, then this is a bad thing because we don't want the heat to go into the water and warm it up because we're trying to keep the water cold. But conversely, if we are moving hot water, like in this example, we're trying to keep the water hot, 160-ish degrees, well, that heat into the fluid, that's not a bad thing. I and mean, we're trying to keep the water warm anyway. But yeah, just this is just to illustrate another example of these interactive effects and what you might think of as a simple motor replacement or a motor upgrade. We're gonna put in a more efficient motor. It's not just the motor that we're thinking about. We also have to think about the system and the fluid that it's conveying. So the bottom line here for interactive effects, even when that energy is converted to something mechanically useful, turn a fan, turn a pump, create light, whatever, eventually all that energy ends up as heat. And that's a big, I put a big star on that because that's a super important point. All of that input energy ends up as heat eventually. Maybe that helps a process, maybe it hurts. As we talk more specifically about specific systems, we'll go more in depth on these interactive effects. Codes and standards. So the first one to mention is ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. They are a nonprofit group. They develop all kinds of standards and other reference material. If you know any HVAC design engineers like myself, or if this is a industry you could see yourself going into, we, we are all very familiar with ASHRAE. 
and one of the biggest standards that they have developed is the 90.1 standard, which this is not a code, but it is the basis for most energy codes around the United States. And what the 90.1 standard does is it defines minimum energy design standards for all the building systems. So this will tell you, here's the minimum standard at which you need to design your lighting systems or your HVAC systems. This isn't the Wild West where you can just go out and design whatever crazy HVAC system you want. This 90.1 standard sets this baseline minimum for, hey, this is what you need to do to make a reasonably efficient building. And so as an energy auditor, this is a big deal. This is updated every three years. Latest is 2019. Next up is the International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. This is, this is its own document, but it is largely based on that ASHRAE 90.1 standard with some changes and amendments that the, uh, the International Code Council thought was necessary. And a lot of states, cities, counties, they use the IECC as their energy code. So um, the state of Idaho, they might say, hey, if you're building a new building, you need to build it to the standard of the IECC. And they just have adopted that as their code. It's also updated every three years, latest being 2018 edition. So if you're an energy engineer or a design engineer, you really need to understand and stay up to date on the state energy codes where you practice engineering. So I practice engineering in Washington, but if there's an engineer in Colorado, they may have their own code that has its own specific differences on what you can and can't do. A lot of them are very similar, but there are some, some differences. The adopted energy code and I underlined addition depends on the state, county, or city. So for example, one state may use the 2015 edition of the IECC and another may use the 2018 edition. Same code, uh, but different edition. So some examples. In Washington, we have our own Washington State Energy Code. Seattle also has its own energy code, um, you know, because they're, Seattle is a very energy conscious city. So what Seattle did is they basically took the Washington code and then made it more strict. But ultimately the Washington state code and the Seattle energy code, they are based on the IECC with some amendments. And the 2018 codes are set to roll out here, um, I think in, in February, maybe a little later. So designers like myself, we're all gonna have to get up to speed on the changes of that 2018 code because that will impact our designs. In Idaho, they go off directly, uh, go off the 2015 IECC. Oregon, uh, at least from what a quick Google search told me, looks like they have their own energy code called the Oregon Zero Energy Ready Commercial Code, abbreviated OZERC. But Ultimately, that, that is, again, largely based on 90.1. Another standard worth talking about uh, in commercial applications. I mentioned earlier that fresh outdoor air needs to be introduced to the building to maintain uh, a certain level of indoor air quality, which we normally don't see this in residential applications, but in commercial buildings, it's a big deal. We need to bring in that fresh air to keep the, uh, the occupants nice and healthy. The standard is called ASHRAE 62.1, which defines the minimum ventilation requirements based on the space type. For example, a school needs more ventilation than an office. Reason being, schools tend to be 
higher, uh, they, they tend to have a higher occupancy per square foot. So there's more people in a school and it's a different type of environment. If you're in a learning environment, you want students to be uh, awake and alert. And so you're going to want to bring in more ventilation than in an office atmosphere. The problem with ventilation air is it is very energy intensive to deal with this. So if you think about heating or cooling that outside air that we're bringing into the building, if we're in a peak winter day and it's zero degrees outside, it takes a lot of energy to heat that air up. Or if we're in peak summer conditions and it's 100 degrees outside, it takes a lot of energy to cool that down. It's very energy intensive. And so what I've seen time and time again, yeah, I know an easy way to save energy. Yeah, it's just shut off the ventilation. Well, technically, yeah, that will save you quite a bit of energy, but it's not a good idea. So this is an example of one of those kind of balancing acts. We want to save energy which to, to save energy, we could turn off the ventilation, but we don't want to compromise something else. So this is the balancing act, provide just enough ventilation to meet code and optimize energy use. Ultimately, indoor air quality standards are going to win over energy standards. They're going to put occupant safety first. And there are many examples like this, where energy use is, is kind of at odds with indoor air quality and room comfort. Uh, another obvious example would be, uh, well, in the winter, let's just keep the building at 50 degrees. Well, yeah, that'll save you a lot of energy, but now you're gonna have a bunch of people moaning and complaining that it's super cold in your building. So you don't wanna do that. So in existing buildings, um, well, modern energy codes today, they are very strict, especially in Washington and then especially even more so in Seattle. Very strict compared to 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, back in the, probably the 1980s, energy codes weren't even really much of a thing. But, but now it's this big, big deal. And the energy code is not that difficult to meet in new buildings. Reason being, if you're building a new building, it, before the building's built, everything's on paper and we can still move stuff around to accommodate whatever needs to be accommodated to meet the code. However, as an energy engineer doing energy audits, essentially everything we're doing is in existing buildings. We can't really do much to audit a new building because it's not built yet. And a new building hasn't had the opportunity for everything to go sideways. So everything we deal with is essentially in existing structures. Existing buildings will always have additional constraints and complications. We can't just move a wall easily in an existing building because we need more space like we can in a, a new building. So when we're doing these upgrades to upgrade these systems of an existing building, there's always this question of, do we need to bring those systems all the way up to code? I mean, if we're working in a 50 year old building do we need to bring all of that up to the 2018 code requirements? And unfortunately, there's not a clear answer. Maybe, sometimes, kind of a gray area. It's going to vary project to project. I mean, every building is unique in how they're built and configured, and there's no clear cut answer. But what we can usually get is an exception based on what is generally called the impracticality clause. That's not an official term, but the idea here is it would be cost prohibitive to fully meet the code and would ultimately kill the project. 
So if we have an energy project where we can make a lot of energy saving strides for a million dollars, let's say, but it would cost $3 million to bring everything up to code. Well, what if your customer doesn't have $3 million? Uh, code officials understand that, hey, sometimes it's impractical to bring things up to code. So this call technically needs to come from a code official, somebody from the state or the county, wherever your project is. We as engineers, we don't get to make that call. We get to make an argument. We can talk to a code official and say, hey, here's what we're dealing with. We're doing everything we can, but here are the, the challenges inherent in this building. So usually this ends up meaning we're going to meet energy code wherever we can and maybe appease that code official by going above and beyond in other areas if there are some specific things that can't be met. So it's really important to know your local energy code uh, because like I said a couple slides ago, every state uh, may have their own version of an energy code, but one size doesn't fit all. There are always going to be these extenuating circumstances. So to close this out, um, I will be posting up on Blackboard the first homework assignment. So some notes on the homework. If I give you Word files, I want you to turn in the Word files back if you're doing it electronically. So don't give me a PDF. Give me back the actual docx files uh, when you turn in your homework. If you want to do it by hand, which has been pretty rare, seems like, uh, I mean, the math in this class is not very hard. I'll tell you that right now. Um, so it seems that most students have preferred to just do things electronically. That works great for me. But if you really want to do something by hand, um, make sure the math is nice and easy to follow. You got your units shown, just kind of basic etiquette there. But ultimately, I don't want your PDFs unless you're uh, scanning in handwritten work. One thing that I do appreciate, not necessarily required, but Word and well, and actually Excel and I think really every Office application, they have this insert equation function. So if you go up into your ribbon uh, on the insert tab, there's this equation button. And this allows you to write mathematical equations that actually show numerators and denominators, which makes the math a lot easier to follow. So this is my preference. You will find that if you've never used this function before, it's a little, um, a, yeah, what's the word? A little clunky to use at first until you get used to kind of how it functions. Once you're used to it, it's, it's really not bad, but your first time trying it, um, you might be scratching your head a little bit, but hey, give it a shot. I'd appreciate it. The reason being is it's pretty hard to follow the numerator and denominators in straight text. It's much easier to follow, and this is using the insert equation function in PowerPoint. So this very clearly allows me to see what's on the top, what's on the bottom. And more importantly, for your sake, if you are checking your units, you know, making sure that things cancel out, this, this very much helps make that very clear. Later on, we're going to have some homework that's in Excel files. You need to turn that in um, as well so I can check your formulas. But we'll come to that later. And when you're doing your math, please identify whatever value or values that are the answers to the problem. So in that previous example, I bolded it, put ANS next to it for answer. Just somehow identify it, um, highlight it, do something, make it clear. And the last slide, tips for success. Lectures will go fast. I would suggest you, you jot down some notes. It's, it's, uh, it's okay if those notes are rough. I mean, I'm not expecting you to take full complete notes based on everything I'm throwing at you. But even if you're just jotting down some random tidbits here and there, well, one that helps keep you awake, 
which I completely understand this Zoom learning environment is really not ideal. And I, I can't really police the class to make sure everyone's paying attention. But if you're taking some notes just on the side, just on a little scratch paper, hey, that's, that's good. Also helps just to make that mental connection. So if I tell you something, that's one connection. If you write it down, that's another connection. I mean, every time you take note of whatever concept we're talking about, that's gonna help it stick. You're gonna have time on most lecture days for homework and ask questions. So lecture time, let's see, it's, it's 75 minutes, 4.50 to 6.05. I don't often need that full 75 minutes. So I highly recommend you stick around, ask me questions. I'm fine even just hanging out if you wanna work on homework in the background, just so I'm available. But use that time. When you're submitting your homework through Blackboard, Blackboard does allow for unlimited attempts, which is the term Blackboard uses. So if you turn in an assignment and then you're talking to your study partner and you realize, oh man, I totally screwed up something, you can resubmit it before that due date. I don't grade anything until the due date. So feel free to submit stuff early and then just put in a new attempt um, if, you, if you need to update it. All these slides, I'll post them to Blackboard um, and then the YouTube video as well, I'll throw on a link. And when you're doing homework, um, I mean, download these slides, review them while you're doing the homework, it'll be a big help. And this is an important concept. After doing a homework problem, reread the problem statement and then ask yourself, did I answer the question? Are the units right? That's the, countless times I'll be, I'll be working on homework and there will be an answer to a problem and it, it's not answering the question that was asked. So it takes you about three seconds to just go back reread the problem statement. Just make sure you're actually answering the question I'm asking. So that's it for day one. Uh, I wish I could say uh, we had a great start, but um, apologies about the internet problems. Um, hopefully I'll have better luck here moving forward. So feel free to reach out via email with questions and I will talk to you on Thursday.